Welcome to Audit the Audit, where we sort out the who and what and the right and wrong of police interactions. This episode covers the absurd results doctrine, personal effects, and obstructing justice, and is brought to us by Shared Ignorance's channel. Be sure to check out the description below and give them the credit that they deserve. In a video posted on October 8th, 2020, it appears that the owner of the Shared Ignorance YouTube channel, who I will refer to as Mr. Shared, was confronted by Officer Pete Stachy and Sergeant Richard Basor of the Genesee Township PD while riding his motorcycle in a school parking lot after hours in Genesee Township, Michigan. While Officer Stachy initially approached Mr. Shared on his own, the footage begins just after Sergeant Basor arrives on the scene. Is that a is that a felony or a listen, misdemeanor? Listen, we're not going to debate here on, on camera, okay? You're oh, going to answer my questions, okay? And you're going to you're going to provide me your identification. Am I legally you're, obligated you're being to? Detained right now, yeah. What crime am I being detained for? Yeah. I need to know what crime. Where's your bag over here? You're littering. I'm littering. You, you put the bag down over <laughs> there, but yet you're not saying nothing about it. Oh, uh, are you going to de-escalate this, sir? He pulled me over and asked me what I'm doing here, and if I go to school here. Do you go to school here? No, I don't go to school okay. here. But then he this he asked me why I put I'm why I'm leaving. I said uh, I'm just riding around the parking lot. And now he's asking me questions, saying I'm littering and I'm being detained and I'm being detained. I don't. I'm not legally obligated to answer your questions. What's your name and your badge number? That's a statue. Is, Is that what you tell the judge? Yeah, that's what I tell the judge. Uh, what, can you de-escalate? You, can you, you de 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 escalate this situation? He's, you need to stay away from me. First, it's six you, feet. What do you tell the judge? It's I don't I don't have to tell the judge. I'm 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 a private citizen. Talk to the sergeant here. You're the, are you the sergeant? I am the sergeant. Thank you. Okay. Thank you no. for de-escalating this. Okay. One, What's your name and badge Sergeant Basor. I'm with the Genesee Township Police Department. Thank you okay. for being professional. All right. Is this your vehicle? Is, is hold on. I don't I don't request any searches or seizures of my property. Is it your bag? Yes or no. I, is it your bag? Yes or no? Yes, it's my bag. Okay. Why you you throw put it my down? bag why, down, why dude. Why did you throw it down? I already, I don't have to answer your questions. I'm not illegally obligated to answer your questions. The officers accuse Mr. Shared of littering by placing his bag down and walking away from it. And Mr. Shared correctly informs the officers that he is under no legal obligation to answer their questions. Section 324.8901 of the Michigan Complied Laws defines litter as, quote, rubbish, refuse, waste material, garbage, offal, paper, glass, cans, bottles, trash, debris, or other foreign substances, end quote, as well as abandoned vehicles, vessels, off-road vehicles, and snowmobiles. Applying this definition of litter, Section 324.8902 of the Michigan Complied Law states that a person shall not knowingly deposit, place, throw, or leave litter on public property or water other than property designated and set aside for such purposes. While attempting to interpret this statute, it's important to keep in mind Section 8.3a of the Michigan Complied Laws, which requires that, quote, all words and phrases shall be construed and understood according to the common and approved usage of the language. Under a plain reading of these statutes, it is arguable that Mr. Shared's actions did constitute littering, as he placed his backpack, which is a foreign substance, on public property. However, Section 8.3 of the Michigan Complied Laws allows an exception to the common language rule of statutory construction when, quote, such construction would be inconsistent with the manifest intent of the legislature. A court might also stray from the common meaning of the statutory language under the absurd results doctrine, which allows a departure from the plain meaning of the statute when a literal reading would produce absurd results. But case law is inconsistent about whether the doctrine is recognized in Michigan. In the 2012 case of Johnson v. Recca, the Supreme Court of Michigan acknowledged that the justices disagreed about the absurd results doctrine, but then went on to say that to properly invoke the doctrine, a court must determine that it is, quote, quite impossible that the legislature could have intended the plain meaning. While the construction of the littering law that prohibits temporarily placing objects on the ground in a public place could certainly lead to absurd results, such as forbidding individuals from placing their bags beside them while sitting on a park bench, or setting down an infant carrier while changing a diaper, and it seems unlikely that this is the type of behavior the legislature intended to outlaw, Michigan law is not clear as to whether a judge can accept this as a justification to interpret the statute differently. Unfortunately, there are no readily available court decisions construing Michigan's littering laws, and given the uncertain state of the absurd results doctrine in Michigan precedent, it is difficult to predict how a court would interpret the statute as applied to Mr. Shared's actions. I come here and I practice riding my motorcycle. Okay. I take my bag off and put it right there so I'm not riding with it on me. Okay. All I did was pull up, check my tire pressure, put my bag down, okay. 
right. and he came up to me asking questions saying i was being detained that's a that's an illegal detainment People that leave bags around that we're at a school where there's kids at and practicing football, he deemed it suspicious. He doesn't know who you are, that's, so he's checking you out. And he's asking some simple questions. And that's understandable, but uh, suspicion is not a crime. Okay, if he deems it suspicious, just the same as if, if somebody was driving a motorcycle in your, in your he, neighborhood, just hear me out. Okay, go ahead. I'm somebody sorry. was driving a, a motorcycle in your neighborhood and they dropped a bag that was near their home. When you want, or near your home, when you want us to at least check them out. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Right, but it was the way he did it. It was the way he did it. It was very unprofessional and aggressive. And he was treating me like I'm a criminal, like I did something wrong. So, as it stands. It didn't start out being defensive. Why are you, why are, I don't, I don't. Did you forfeit this bag when you sat it over there? You want I don't bag? forfeit my bag for sending it over there. You drove it away, like I just got done saying. If you, you left it there, if you left it there drove away from it, you lose an expectation of privacy for it. Officer Stachi searched Mr. Sherrod's bag over his protests, while Sergeant Basor attempted to justify the search by arguing that Mr. Sherrod lost his expectation of privacy in the bag by leaving it unattended. The Fourth Amendment protects, quote, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. In the 1997 case of United States versus Chadwick, the U.S. Supreme Court determined that individuals possess an important privacy interest in the contents of personal luggage that is protected by the Fourth Amendment. The court reasoned that, quote, by placing personal effects inside a double-locked footlocker, respondents manifested an expectation that the contents would remain free from public examination. No less than one who locks the doors of his home against intruders, one who safeguards his personal possessions in this manner, is due the protection of the Fourth Amendment warrant clause. However, Courts have determined that an individual can lose their expectation of privacy in their effects by abandoning them. In the 2002 case of People v. Taylor, the Michigan Court of Appeals concluded that, quote, the search and seizure of property that has been abandoned is presumptively reasonable because the owner no longer has an expectation of privacy in the abandoned property. The proof required to substantiate abandonment should reasonably lead to an exclusive inference of throwing away. Whether an owner abandoned his property is an ultimate fact that turns on a combination of act and intent. In this situation, it is clear that Mr. Sherrod did not intend to abandon or throw away the bag, and therefore, it is likely that a court would find he maintained an expectation of privacy in his backpack, particularly because he remained nearby while the bag was placed on the ground. Even if a court concluded that Mr. Sherrod forfeited his expectation of privacy by leaving his bag in a public place, the Fourth Amendment would still protect his bag from unreasonable searches and seizures. In the 2012 case of United States v. Jones, the U.S. Supreme Court concluded that, because the Fourth Amendment protects an individual's property interests, any search where, quote, the government obtains information by physically intruding on a constitutionally protected area is subject to constitutional scrutiny. Citing to the Jones decision, the Michigan Court of Appeals held in the 2012 20 case of People v. Tims that, quote, in a criminal case, a search or a seizure conducted without a warrant is generally unreasonable, unless, under the circumstances, both probable cause and an exception to the requirement of a judicial warrant exists. Because there is no exception to the warrant requirement for effects temporarily placed on public property, it is highly likely that a court would conclude Officer Stachi violated Mr. Sherrod's Fourth Amendment rights by searching his backpack. No, that's, that is not correct. You, you're telling me I can't sit my bag down to practice riding my motorcycle? But you, never, but you jumped to a conclusion and went well, right to the defense. Right, All you need to do exactly. is tell them. No, I'm not legally obligated first to tell him all, anything. First of all, I don't even know who you are. You don't have Where to know who I am. <laughs> okay, if he deemed it suspicious, is he checking it suspicion out? Suspicion is not a crime. You're operating a motor vehicle. No, I'm not. I'm property. parked. I'm parked. At the time you were. You I'm parked when he that. pulled up. I was parked. Okay. Do you have an identification? Do you have an identification? Am, I don't answer questions. I'm not answering any questions. That was very unprofessional of him. It was very aggressive. I'm glad you you de-escalated. I don't know what he would have done if you didn't de-escalate that. Okay. All right, we're good. We're good. What do you mean we're good? What I'm, do you I'm gonna. Want? You want something else done? Yeah, your card. What I want you your want? card. I want you your card. I want your card. I'll make sure you get it. You talk I got to it right here. I Thank you. I'll give it to him. You have a legal obligation to know. We need to know who you are. Okay. If you say no, I don't have telling you who I am. And we're investigating something that we deem to be suspicious. Now you're obstructing. We could have took that extra step and said you're demanded, and we're demanding that we see a license from you. But he didn't. You can't detain someone without a crime, though. No. Suspicious is not a, a crime. There's a difference. A simple detainment is separate from an arrest. 
Are you in handcuffs? Well, you could. You are could... you in handcuffs? No, sir. But you, are you have you been told you've been placed under arrest? No, sir. Okay. So all he's doing is talking with you to deem whether or not something was suspicious. And yes, at a school after hours when there's no other people around and you leave a bag around, yeah, that that can be cer certainly deemed suspicious. And we want to make sure that our kids are safe here. And in doing so, we're doing our job. Yes, sir. Okay. So yeah, he is going to check it out, and I expect him to as my officer to do that. Okay. Okay. All right, and um, who do I speak to about this as far as like uh? You're talking to him. All right, and you're saying that my, my rights weren't violated at all no, in any way? No, he checked it out. If, you, if you weren't sitting in the back of his car and this is a personal contact, okay, and he wants to know who you are, he could have went down the road of obstruction, but he didn't. You, that's a secondary charge. Obstruction, you have to have a... You haven't been charged with anything yet. Right, so how can he charge me with obstruction? Because we don't know who you are. Sergeant Basor tells Mr. Sherrod that he could have been charged with obstructing because he refused to identify himself, despite the fact that Michigan law does not require him to do so. While many states have established stop and identify statutes that require individuals to provide their names to officers in certain situations, neither Michigan nor Genesee Township have passed laws requiring identification under any circumstances. In a concurring opinion for the 2019 case of People v. Barrera, the Michigan Court of Appeals concluded that, although police officers are free to ask a person for identification without implicating the Fourth Amendment, Michigan has not adopted a requirement that a detained person identify himself in the course of an investigatory stop, and noted that, quote, the defendant's refusal to identify himself to officers was not itself in violation of any law, and therefore did not provide the officers with probable cause to arrest him on that basis. Even in states that have passed stop and identify statutes, officers cannot ask for identification without a reasonable basis for believing the individual was involved in criminal activity. In the 1979 case of Brown v. Texas, the U.S. Supreme Court reversed a criminal conviction under Texas's identification law, concluding that the application of the statute, quote, to detain appellant and require him to identify himself violated the Fourth Amendment because the officers lacked any reasonable suspicion to believe appellant was engaged or had engaged in criminal conduct. Accordingly, appellant may not be punished for refusing to identify himself. While the Department of Homeland Security considers an unattended backpack to be suspicious activity that could indicate terrorism or terrorism-related crime, under the totality of the circumstances, it seems likely that a court would conclude that Officer Stachi did not have a reasonable suspicion that Mr. Sherrod was engaged in criminal activity, particularly given the fact that he remained in the vicinity of the bag, instead of fleeing, as one typically would if the bag contained explosives or other dangerous materials. As to whether Mr. Sherrod could be charged with obstruction, the relevant provisions of Section 750.5 479 of the Michigan Complied Laws define the offense as knowingly and willfully obstructing an officer acting in the performance of his or her duties, or obstructing an officer enforcing an ordinance, law, rule, order, or resolution of the Common Council of a City Board of Trustees, the Common Council or Village Council of an Incorporated Village, or a Township Board of a Township. The statute also clarifies that obstructing, quote, includes the use or threatened use of physical interference or force, or a knowing failure to comply with a lawful command. Because Mr. Sherrod in no way physically interfered with the officers, and their command to identify himself was not supported by a stop and identify statute, it is highly likely a judge would find that Mr. Sherrod was not guilty of obstructing. He hasn't done anything wrong, and neither have you, and we're going to leave it at that. He my took bag. he he illegally searched my bag and okay. took my ID I'm and he ID'd me. You. I have a right to privacy as a private citizen. So he, I'm not being detained right Nobody now. Nobody said you're being detained right now. You can walk away if you want to. Well, he detained me. Is what he said. He said I was being detained. At that point, he said you were detained, but you still weren't in handcuffs. You weren't putting anything. He was just trying to figure out what was going on. Right, but I was being detained for. Uh, Mr. Sherrod requested Sergeant Basor's business card and reasserted that he was not legally obligated to provide his name in these circumstances. As Sergeant Basor got in his vehicle and drove away, Mr. Sherrod also requested the name of his lieutenant. It is unclear whether Mr. Sherrod followed up with the Genesee Township PD or filed a complaint, or if he is pursuing legal action based on this encounter. Overall, Officer Stachi gets an F for misusing the authority of Michigan's littering laws, conducting what appeared to be an illegal search of Mr. Sherrod's bag, and for failing to employ any measure of de-escalation. According to Officer Stachi's logic, the moment a citizen walks away from their vehicle in a parking lot, it becomes subject to search and seizure. And that idea blatantly contradicts the current interpretation of the Fourth Amendment. As mentioned before, intent is a factor in determining whether an item has been abandoned, and Mr. Sherrod did not intend to leave his bag in the parking lot. 
This fact alone negates the validity of this stop to a large degree. Officer Stachi's assertion that Mr. Shared's conduct constituted a violation of the littering code is clearly not the type of behavior the code intended to regulate, and the officer's willingness to dishonor the spirit of the code to justify a detainment and search speaks for itself. All of the information that was needed to determine the suspiciousness of Mr. Shared's behavior could have been collected through observation and consensual encounter. But, due to Officer Stachi's condescending and dismissive attitude, this stop only served to leave a citizen feeling violated and wary of future police encounters. Sergeant Basor also gets an F. Because although he did make an uninspiring attempt to de-escalate the situation, he did so by attempting to justify the clearly questionable conduct of his officer, dismissing Mr. Sherrod's concerns about his civilian rights and accusing Mr. Sherrod of obstructing an investigation. Sergeant Basor's blind loyalty to Officer Stachi was on full display during this interaction, and his assertion that Mr. Sherrod could be arrested for obstruction was baseless and could be interpreted as an intimidation tactic. Instead of simply listening to Mr. Sherrod's concerns and directing him to the proper channels to file a complaint, Sergeant Basor chose to engage in a debate about the legality of Officer Stachi's conduct with the alleged victim. Not only did the sergeant potentially discourage Mr. Shared from filing a complaint, but he also encouraged Officer Stachi to continue exhibiting his bullish behavior. This interaction highlights the importance of good leadership within a department, and the actions of lower-level supervisors, like sergeants, are often representative of the perspectives held by the entire chain of command. That may or may not be the case for the Genesee Township Police Department, but there is no denying that Sergeant Basor could have handled this interaction with more professionalism and regard for Mr. Shared's concerns. Mr. Shared gets an A-, minus because although he did struggle to properly articulate some of his points, he challenged the legitimacy of the stop, made a legitimate effort to dispel the officer's suspicions, and invoked his right to remain silent despite being threatened with arrest. Knowing the exact verbiage and vocabulary of legal concepts is not nearly as important as wielding the rights granted by those concepts effectively. It is obvious that Mr. Shared is not extremely well-versed in the law, but he did know enough to begin recording, invoke his right to silence, and determine that the search of his bag may have been illegal. Mr. Shared protested his detainment without becoming physically combative or vulgar, and he maintained an adequate balance between complying with the demands of the officers and upholding his constitutional rights. I commend Mr. Shared for having the courage to invoke his constitutional rights and the awareness to do so tactfully. Be sure to check out the Shared Ignorance channel and let them know that I sent you. You can find a link in the description below. Let us know if there is an interaction or legal topic you would like us to discuss in the comments below. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to check out the ATA Patreon page for more police interaction content.